Now I move to questions to the Minister for the Economy. I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My, my department is committed to the delivery of the new outcomes-based programme for government and the refocus economic strategy to increasing the competitive, competitiveness of the Northern Ireland economy and growing employment and prosperity for all. In doing so, it will be important in, uh, to ensure that growth goes hand-in-hand hand with improvement in people's living standards. It is a matter of record that earnings in Northern Ireland have historically been lower relative to the rest of the United Kingdom. This partially explains why Northern Ireland's level of gross disposable household income per head has continually been lower than other parts of the UK. On a more positive note, in April 2015, median gross weekly earnings for full-time employees in Northern Ireland was £485, and that was up 5.4 per cent from £460 in 2014. This represents the largest annual percentage increase in earnings since 2004 and the first increase in inflation-adjusted earnings in two, since 2009. The median gross weekly earnings for full-time employees in Northern Ireland is now 92 per cent of the UK level and is at its highest since the survey began in 1997. High inflation has the effect of eroding earnings growth and therefore reducing any possible increase in gross disposable household income. At the height of the financial crisis in 2008, inflation was running at over 5 per cent. However, inflation has been, has been at historically low levels for some time now. And at April 2016, inflation, as measured by the Consumer Prices Index, was 0.3 per cent. With wages growing faster than inflation, this will result in a higher gross disposable household income. Mr. Speaker, the most effective way of increasing household income is to have more people in better jobs. Since 2012, we have seen 40,000 new jobs created, with 26,000 fewer claiming unemployment than at April 2013. We know from research that businesses are innovative and invest more in R&D and are, are more likely to be successful in global markets, employ more people and pay higher salaries, that is, more and better jobs. Uh, I believe that uh, this will make a, doing, continuing with that policy will make a massive contribution to increasing local household incomes. Mr Nesbitt for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for the answer and, and wish him well in his, his new post. But does he accept there has been a failure to close the prosperity gap, as evidenced by the latest figures? from the Office of National Statistics that say in terms of gross disposable household income, uh, Northern Ireland has the lowest uh, of the four home countries and based on a comparison with the previous year, we are demonstrating negative growth. I thank the, uh, the member for his uh, congratulations. I, I, look, I, I do accept that um, in terms of our level of gross disposable household income, uh, the levels are, are disappointing. I think the latest figures for 2014 show um, 14,645 uh, pounds per head is the, the uh, average figure in um, Northern Ireland, which is about 81.5% of the UK uh, average, which is, which is not good enough. Um, and, you know, I could stand here and say to the, the member in the House, Mr Speaker, that this is something that has been historically the case and that Northern Ireland has always had far lower earnings on average than the rest of the United Kingdom um, and just accept that as a sort of a, something that we can't really do much about given that we have done little to uh, erode that gap over the last 10, 20, 30 or more years. Uh, but I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that we can, uh, in creating um, in trying to create a, a better, stronger economy for Northern Ireland, that that isn't just bringing in more jobs, but it's bringing in better jobs. And by saying better jobs, I mean jobs that are paying more money to, to people in Northern Ireland. And it's one of the areas in which one of the factors uh, that we can influence as a government, or at least try to influence, is to try to attract more and better jobs. And yes, we've managed to bring in 40,000 jobs over the, the, the last five years. I want to see that continue and grow and do better over this Assembly term. Uh, and just out of interest, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, between 2011 and 2016, the jobs that the executive through Invest Northern Ireland were able to attract into to Northern Ireland, 64% of those who were created by locally owned companies, 64% of them were above, above the private sector median wage, and 72% of them, 72% uh, were over the private sector median wage when they were created by external investors into Northern Ireland. So by, by targeting um, our, our work with Invest Northern Ireland on more jobs, yes, but also better jobs, jobs that, are, that will increase, uh, that have higher wages, it will also increase the gross disposable uh, household income for people right across Northern Ireland. Very good. Call Mr Gordon Lyons. 
Speaker, the DUP understands the importance of low taxation, and in particular low household taxation. Does the Minister agree with me that the policies that the Executive has put in place has actually helped in regards to disposable income in Northern Ireland? Yeah, the, the member's right, and I, I share his, his pride in the fact that we are a, a low tax party and have earned that, uh, rightly earned that reputation over the years, both in, in local government and here in, in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, Mr. Speaker, the, Taxation is, is one of those issues that does is a factor in respect of um, disposable household incomes. Uh, there are other factors as well. That's the size of a household, and in Northern Ireland, households tend to have more, more children in them. Um, there are also factors around inflation, like, like I mentioned, uh, and earnings as well. But taxation is a factor. Now, there is little that we can do to affect, um, for example, income tax. Although the changes that the, the Her Majesty's Government have brought in in terms of increasing the personal allowance will disproportionately benefit people uh, in Northern Ireland because of their, their lower incomes. But as an Assembly, we have a, a proud record of uh, keeping household taxes down. We have the lowest household taxes in the whole of the United Kingdom. Average household bill in Northern Ireland in 2015-16 was £842, and that compared favourably to Scotland, where it was £1,300, in, in England, where it was £1,400, and in Wales, where it was over £1,500. So when you totalise all of that up over the five years of the, the last executive, the average householder in Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker, saved £2,500 over those years. And when you, when you add on top of that policies that the executive have pursued, uh, like free transport for over 60s and keeping a loan pensioners allowance in place, many of which are, are policies that some in this House, even never mind people outside of this House, have, have told us that we need to get rid of, that they're too expensive, that we don't need them anymore. Some, in fact, ran during the recent election on a platform calling for increased rates and the introduction of water charges and so on and so forth. Um, all by, by maintaining that policy of, of, of taking pride in the fact that we do have the lowest household taxes in the UK and withstanding that pressure, withstanding that pressure that there has been inside this assembly and outside to increase local taxes, it has helped clearly to ensure that gross disposable household income in Northern Ireland is not worse than it, than it is. Well, Mr. Chris Little. The, the DUP do claim uh, to deliver low household costs. Uh, along with Sinn Féin. However, childcare costs, for which they have been and continue to be responsible, are second only to mortgage payments for many people in our community and prevent many people from accessing employment. Will the Economy Minister therefore support an increase in the free hours of early education and childcare available to families in Northern Ireland to at least 20 hours per week? I mean, look, of course, I think everybody in this House recognises that there are uh, long-standing, deep-seated structural issues in terms of, of childcare in Northern Ireland and why it's not um, as good as we would want it to be or doesn't compare favourably with uh, provision, for example, in, in Great Britain. Uh, but it, um, and of course, I would want to support seeing more free childcare places provided to um, people across Northern Ireland. But I leave that. Um, uh, I, not, I don't wish to intrude on, on the departmental responsibilities of other ministers, and I think that's a, a responsibility for the Minister of Education, if I'm, if I'm right in saying that. Uh, and I will leave it to his good offices, my, my friend, my colleague, Mr. Weir, to, to advance that in a, a sustainable way. Uh, it is, oh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, brave of the, of the member uh, to stand up in this House and, and seek to lecture me and my party in terms of uh, cost of, of, of business, uh, or cost of, um, to, to households in Northern Ireland and taxation. His party was a party that uh, ran in the recent election, at least they, to, to be fair, at least they, they honestly of running on a platform of wanting to see water charges introduced, uh, wanting to see rates increased, wanting to, to do away with that proud record that we have of having the lowest household taxes in the whole of the United Kingdom. And, and as Mr Nesbitt's question has, has um, elicited, uh, gross house, uh, disposable household income in, in Northern Ireland is lower than we would like it to be. Um, it would certainly be far worse if the Alliance Party had its way and people in Northern Ireland were paying four or five hundred pound uh, water bills and increased, radically increased uh, rates bills as well. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Would the minister agree that um, unrestrained immigration, to which we are subjected by virtue of our membership of the EU, has a downward pressure on wages and income, and thus suppresses household incomes? And thus is there opportunity on the 23rd of June to do something radically positive about that. Can, can, can Mr. Speaker, commend the member on his, on his innovation in introducing 
the EU referendum and to, to question on gross disposable household income. Um, it is it is that sort of innovation that I would like to see many of our companies in Northern Ireland display, and, and that would, if they did, we would have a, a wonderful, uh, fantastic economy. Look, I, I think the, the, the issue that he raises is a, is a, is a pertinent point and a, and, a, and a good point. Now, look, I think there are issues, and clearly issues, perhaps less so in Northern Ireland and more in other parts of the United Kingdom, around immigration and the effect that it does have on a local and a regional, and indeed in some cases, national, national economy. Um, you know, I think that we, we have, in Northern Ireland, benefited from immigration as well, uh, both in the public sector in terms of many staff, particularly within our, our NHS, which had the, um, the, uh, the privilege of being Minister for, for Health uh, for the last year. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to, to cope if it wasn't for people who were coming into Northern Ireland to provide much needed services. And similarly, in many businesses, I have a constituency which uh, I represent a constituency which has many agri food businesses, and many of the staff within those businesses are coming from other parts of the world to work within those businesses, and those businesses wouldn't be able to survive if it wasn't for that support. But I do absolutely understand and take on board the point that the member makes. Uh, and if indeed there was unrestrained uh, immigration into the United Kingdom, it would have a depressive effect as a member indicates, uh, on, in terms of household incomes and the economy generally. Before we move to the next question, it was remiss of me, Minister, not to welcome you to your first uh, uh, question time in your new role. I think that's because we've become so used to you being at the dispatch box there. Also to inform members that question number seven has been uh, withdrawn. Call Mr Alex Maskey. Well, I guess Dr Controller, can uh, uh, over to all question number two, please? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your, your comments as well. Business investment in R&D is, is critical to economic growth. It, it leads to new innovative products and processes, increases in productivity, uh, and can drive uh, sustainable export growth. To deliver our vision of a more dynamic and competitive economy, Northern Ireland needs uh, many more companies engaging in R&D and innovation. In recent years, through the excellent work of InvestNI, our universities and our colleges, we have made positive progress in this area. Their support has helped create the conditions where our companies are now investing more than £400 million annually in research and development. That's up 25 per cent since 2009, and I think most encouragingly, we now have more firms than ever before investing in R&D. In the last year alone, InvestNI has supported businesses, the majority of which are local companies, both small and large, to invest £70 million in research and development. This has created a, a strong foundation for us to drive forward our ambitious plans for the economy, and my department, through its delivery bodies and working in partnership with the private sector, will continue to focus on getting more companies engaged in R&D. There are a, a range of interventions already in place to deliver this, whether it is the Invest NI monthly R&D clinics and the financial assistance from the grant for R&D program, or the Higher Education Innovation Fund run by universities, or the Employer Support Program run by our colleges. The challenge we face in, is supporting companies to take the risk to invest in R&D, because R&D is, is a risk, but it is a necessary one to drive sustained company growth. Mr. Maskey, for a supplementary. I can thank the Minister for that uh, quite a comprehensive response. And obviously, the Finance Minister today uh, referred specifically to uh, allocations for skills and further education. The Minister has, of course, addressed the fact that Invest NI and skills and further education are key components to uh, assisting local businesses. Could the Minister give us some assurance around the work that Invest NI uh, and the further education sector and the skills sector will actually embark upon to ensure that local companies do get? enough support to attract particularly inward investment? I think skills is incredibly important both in terms of attracting inward investment into Northern Ireland but also in helping our indigenous firms to, to grow and expand and to uh, realise opportunities that are out there in the global marketplace. Um, and, and skills is in developing our skills is a key component of our uh, new program for government draft program for government framework. Uh, one of the indicators, as the member I'm sure will know, is, is to improve the skills profile of, of our population. There are a range of strategies which are in place, which I'll, I'll not, not bore the member of the House with, in terms of trying to ensure that we do have the right skills in place, whether that's delivered through higher education or, or further education or through uh, apprenticeships or, or, or youth um, training. Um, you know, I, I think there are, uh, as I indicated, some of the measures that are in place already um, through Invest Northern Ireland or colleges or universities to try to work with firms. And it is a process of working with them and to, to encourage them and to, in many cases, bring firms which have 
tentatively been involved in research and development or never before been involved in research and development to, to try to get them to do that for, for the first time in the hope that they would continue to do that. So there are a range of, of schemes in place. There's a, as I mentioned, an uh, Invest NI grant scheme. There's also R&D clinics. Uh, there are various funds in higher and further education. And there are also national schemes around and There's an HMRC uh, tax credit scheme and there's the patent box scheme, which uh, reduces corporation tax to 10% for patents which are registered uh, in the UK. And there's also a small business research uh, initiative which uh, has been utilised by my department um, in initially on, on a small scale project around tourism apps, uh, but has more recently then in concert with the Department of Agriculture uh, and Rural Development as it was and now uh, DERA um, on poultry litter and I, I hope to be in a, a position to make a positive announcement in respect of that in the not too distant future. So there are a range of measures that are in place to try to encourage uh, businesses, whether they're uh, indigenous firms or external investors, whether they're small, medium or large scale businesses to get into R&D uh, and to continue to try to use it as a way to improve our economy. Call Mr. Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Minister, for your answers thus far and may I wish you well in your new post. Traditionally, most investment in research and development has gone on in the Greater Belfast area. Can the Minister outline how he plans to increase investment west of the ban, especially in my own constituency of Fermanagh South Tyrone? Uh, thank the member for his question. Welcome him to, to, to the uh, Assembly and thank him for his, his kind comments. Um, I'm tempted to say that the First Minister will ensure that I, I, I do my best to bring investment to, to the member's constituency. I think that's uh, stimulus and motivation enough for, for me to do my job in that respect. But I, I think the reason I had a um, um, discussion on this issue with one of his party colleagues uh, last week during a debate on, on manufacturing in Northern Ireland, and there certainly there, there is a perception that there is a uh, an imbalance in terms of where investment and job creation goes in Northern Ireland. And I, I can understand that. I mean, I think there are a lot of members in this House representing constituencies that aren't even in the west of the band, but also in, in around the greater Belfast area could perhaps point at elements that suggest that they don't get as, as much investment as they, uh, they would like. And of course, everybody is going to fight very hard for, for their own constituency, Mr. Speaker. But there are uh, some interesting figures which show from the, the 2011 to 2012 to 2015 16 period. Uh, that an investment in the east of the province was 282 jobs per 10,000 head of population, but in the west of the province it was actually 301 jobs per, per 10,000 uh, of, of the population. So if you took at it on a population basis, there are obviously more people living east of, east of the ban and east of the province, but actually in terms of jobs created through Invest in I assistance, it has actually been greater in, in the west of the province, and the member will be, I'm sure, familiar with some of those examples which have been in his constituency. So Dunbea recently made an announcement of creating 209 new jobs in Dungannon, and also in Dungannon Westland uh, with 70 new jobs with an investment of 9.6 million. Uh, and in Fermanagh, Tele Performance and Enniskillen have committed to creating 800 jobs. And I can give the member um, the assurance through the, the new programme for government as well, which has a, an outcome right at the head of it, that we will we prosper through a strong, competitive, regionally balanced economy. So creating wealth, creating and developing our economy, improving our economy, and creating jobs is something that we want to do for the whole of Northern Ireland, but we want to see that regionally balanced and spread right across Northern Ireland so that everybody in Northern Ireland can prosper. Call Mr. Marvin Story. Hey, Mr. Speaker, can I welcome uh, my friend and colleague to his first question time and wish him well in his new role. The Minister will be well aware of the turbulent times that the manufacturing industry has had in my own constituency in North Antrim, and will he outline to the House specifically the benefits that R&D have uh, had as a result of investment in North Antrim, and, and I think particularly of companies such as Macaulay Engineering and others who have been beneficiaries, and will the Minister give a commitment to that continuing? Thank the member for, for his question and for, for, for his best wishes as well. Um, and yes, the member's constituency has had a, a rougher and tougher time than probably any other constituency over the last six, nine, twelve months in, in terms of the impact on, on jobs. And, and, and those, those two huge firms, JTI and, and Michelin, and their decision to, to close their operations. And of course, as a department, uh, we will use do everything that we possibly can to try to soften that blow for the, the workers in, in both of those firms. Um, but what we can also do, and I would hope that we will be able to continue to do, is try to work with businesses in that area so that they can grow and expand and, and uh, take on more employment. One of the ways in which we can do that, of course, is, as the member indicates, to increase investment in, in research and in development. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased that in, in the, la uh, the last financial year, uh, some £1 million was invested through um, the grant projects 
from Invest Northern Ireland in the North Antrim constituency, and that, that was supporting a total investment of just over four million pounds. Um, some examples of that um, are, um, and he mentions Macaulay Engineering, which is a firm that I, I visited with uh, the member some, some years ago in a previous role. Um, and that's an exceptional firm and, and uh, goes from strength to strength. Another great firm that we're all very, very proud of, no matter what part of Northern Ireland we come from, or represent is Wright Bus, of course. Uh, and they've received £5 million of assistance, which un unlocked £26 million worth of overall investment over the last five years. And that has allowed them to in invest in innovation and remain market leaders and to continue with exports to Hong Kong and Singapore and India and elsewhere. So you know, th that, is a, that is one example. There are others as well um, of, a, of investments of what are small and sometimes modest amounts of money, which unlocks investment by the firm themselves, which in turn not only, not only stabilizes that business, keeps that business in place, but allows that business to grow and in so doing, take on more people. And I know that that's something that's very dear to the heart of the member and indeed other members who represent the North Antrim constituency. Stephen Farry. Mr. Speaker, I too wish the new minister well in his post. Given that Northern Ireland has a much higher dependence upon European funding for R&D spend than most other regions of the UK, how does the minister envisage making up the shortfall in research funding in the event of a Brexit, not least that we can't rely on the UK government to replicate the level of funding, not least given that Barna Formula wouldn't essentially cover what we are actually losing, even if the government were minded to actually meet the Barna Formula level of funding? Thank the member for, for, for his question and his, and his good wishes as well. As innovative as the, the member's uh, two rows behind him in uh, introducing this, this subject matter, I, you know, I, I'm not going to stand here and deny to the member or the House that Northern Ireland has been a beneficiary in terms of uh, R&D funding and innovation funding coming from um, the European Union. Um, Horizon 2020 is obviously the big funding stream at this moment in time. The member will know from, from his previous role uh, that Northern Ireland has set in, uh, increased targets, ambitious targets, to increase our, our drawdown from Horizon 2020. Uh, we've already secured some £28.6 uh, million through research. Um, uh, Northern Ireland researchers have secured nearly uh, just over £28 million, as I said, euros. And there's been an additional £23.5 million for a, a Queen's uh, project, on Queen's University project on, on innovation within medicine. Um, so that's over, just over £50 million has been drawn down between January 14 and November of, of last year. And, you know, the member asks me a question as to how we might make up that uh, difference. The member knows full well, whatever disputes there might be about the number, that the UK is a, a net contributor to the European Union. Uh, and I can't imagine that there is any UK government, whatever its complexion, will not want to spend money in, on research and development and encouraging universities and colleges and businesses in, Nor in Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom to invest in, um, in R&D. And the member talks also about about uncertainty about what any UK government might do, but we also have the uncertainty of what any European Commission might do. Uh, and with an expanding and growing um, European Union heading in a direction which uh, obviously have, brings in more countries which have greater need than Northern Ireland would have, there is every prospect, Mr Speaker, that the money available to Northern Ireland and to the United Kingdom as a whole will diminish over time. Oh, Mr Declan Kearney. Question three. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Universities and colleges are a, a core part of national and regional economic infrastructure, generating employment and output, attracting ex export earnings, and contributing to economic growth. They are also part of local, regional, national, and international networks, influencing the political, social, cultural, and economic climate. At a time of global economic difficulty, governments across the world are looking to the universities to provide ways to support the national and regional economies through development of new ideas, products and services from university research, as well as through continuing to raise the education levels of citizens and our capacity to innovate and adapt. The economic importance of higher education institutions is particularly visible in our regional economy. The knowledge and skills of higher education graduates contribute to the creation of a more flexible and adaptable workforce, which is key to enhancing our region's economic competitiveness. If we are to attract sufficient investment for our economy to grow and for high-quality jobs to be created, we must in turn, in our, in turn invest in the right high-level skills to attract that investment. The higher education sector is a key enabler in establishing a competitive skills system for investors to see Northern Ireland as an attractive place to set up and do business. Mr. Speaker, I can assure the member that I and, and executive colleagues will be examining a variety of options to ensure that our universities remain well positioned to deliver those skills required by the current and future Northern Ireland economy. 
Mr. Kearney for supplementary. Goramaygadara agus Giam Gach Rach agus Jack Eort and Tanairacht Uir. I wish you all the very best in your new ministry. And, and further to that, uh, Minister, have you had a chance to assess the uh, development proposal for the expansion of McGee University? And do you agree that the successful development of that project is essential to addressing the endemic patterns of inequality west of the BAM? Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I recognise the, um, the importance that uh, representatives of the, the FOIL constituency and the North West in general have, have placed upon uh, expansion of the University of, of Ulster, or, sorry, Ulster University uh, at their McGee campus. Uh, and as a member will know, that my, my department has um, recently received an outline business case, which has been submitted to the department with support from a wide range of, of stakeholders from, from the North West. Uh, and that will be considered. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on, on its merits, as you would expect it to be, uh, and it would also be considered in the context of, of wider policy implications, particularly in terms of uh, the sustainable financing of, of the sector. I, I do recognise that Ulster University do have an aim to increase undergraduate numbers at McGee, uh, and I know that that will have, and I, you know, I, I'm absolutely certain that doing so would have a, a positive impact on the economy of that, that area, both in terms of direct impact on the economy and the uh, wider impact and positive impact that it would have on making it a more uh, attractive place to, to, to invest in. But uh, I think you would expect me uh, to consider uh, all of those points in respect of, in the context of the budget available to me and the, the executive uh, much wider, and also the implications for wider policy around student, student numbers. But it's certainly something that um, the outline business case, as I say, has been received by the department. I will be giving it careful consideration. Uh, and as the member would expect me to, I will want to do that in concert with uh, some dialogue with executive colleagues as well. Call Mrs. Rose, may pardon. Minister, can I also congratulate you on your appointment? Clearly, universities are currently not being funded properly to deliver the skills needed and have not been for some time. Does the Minister uh, and the Minister for Education have a plan to deliver a funding model for third level education which will allow universities to offer more undergraduate places and reverse the cuts that have been imposed on them in recent years? Thank the, um, the member for, for her question and for, for her comments. And can, I, can I welcome her to? Uh, I think it's my first opportunity to welcome her, her to the assembly. Uh, you know, I, I think in terms of, of responsibility for this, obviously this resides with uh, myself and not just uh, or not the uh, the minister for, for education. Um, we have obviously received good news today in terms of the, the um, conclusion to the June monitoring round, which has seen uh, 20 million pounds of additional expenditure uh, to my department, much of which will go to. Uh, higher and further education to deal with some of the, the challenges and pressures which the, the member has highlighted. And look, I, I do want to, to see uh, the financing of the sector placed on a long-term sustainable footing. Um, uh, and what I want to do, I want to consider all of the potential options that um, are around that. A department, a previous Department of Employment and Learning conducted a, a consultation in respect of this, which set out a range of different options. I want to study the responses to that consultation and indeed the, the, the options contained within it. And I want to do that um, um, alongside discussions that I, I intend to have with uh, the vice chancellors of our, our two universities. Um, and um, I've had um, passing conversations with uh, at least one of them uh, who's mentioned that the, he has some ideas and some proposals that he wants to uh, put to me. And I, I look forward to, to receiving those. And obviously, I'll give those uh, careful consideration. Because I think it is incredibly important that we do get this, this uh, sector, uh, university sector, onto a sustainable financial footing so that it can make a contribution and continue, sorry, to make a contribution to our economy. Uh, and it can produce graduates with the skills that we require, not just now, but in the future, uh, to ensure that our economy grows in the way that we want it to do. Mr. Buchanan, for a quick question and a quick response from the Minister. Thank you. Can the Minister advise on the main sectors? where graduate skills and employment are likely to drive the economy? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, all of the indications and, and analysis that we are doing show that there are, there are five sectors which are display, displaying employment growth opportunities in Northern Ireland and, and will continue to, to display um, growth uh, opportunities. They are ICT, professional scientific and technical skills, uh, manufacturing, administrative jobs and hospitality and retail jobs. Uh, and in spite of the, the narrative that is sort of developed around 
uh, pressures and challenges on the sector and the financing of the sector and making sure that it's on a sustainable footing. Uh, we do have a record, we do have a very, I think a very strong skills base and we have a record of producing uh, graduates that uh, business needs. So uh, ICT, for example, which is one of those growth areas in terms of employment, uh, we are producing highly skilled graduates. 41% of staff in financial services in Northern Ireland are educated to degree level, and that compares to uh, just 36% in the whole of the UK and 21% in the Republic of Ireland. 70% uh, of IT and telecoms professionals in Northern Ireland hold uh, a higher education level qualification, and that's compared to a UK average of 62%. So in spite of the challenges that the sector uh, has faced and faces and will continue to face, I think Northern Ireland has a very good record of produce, producing highly qualified uh, graduates with the skills that business in Northern Ireland needs. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. I call Mr Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure the Minister is welcomed out, but I would like to go on record and welcome him to his new and latest uh, ministry. Uh, can I ask the Minister for his assessment uh, of the potential economic benefits of bringing John Lewis to Sprucefield? I think the, um, uh, the member for his, for his welcome, I'm sure that this will be the one and only uh, question time where I'm welcome to the House, I'm sure. Um, but, look, I, I, I know it has been, a, um, and I congratulate the member too on, on his election to, to the Assembly. Uh, Mr Speaker, the issue of um, John Lewis coming to Northern Ireland is a long and protracted one, uh, which obviously is one that um, we have all observed, uh, some, from, some from afar representing other constituencies and some obviously very intimately involved, particularly those in, in the Lagan Valley area. Look, I, I think that there, there was a, an opportunity to bring John Lewis to Northern Ireland, not just in terms of having a store. Um, in, uh, at Sprucefield, but also to bring a, a, an opera, you know, the centre of operations for the, what was, I think, intended for the whole of Ireland. I think, unfortunately, uh, we have up to now missed that opportunity. Um, I think that we shouldn't be seen as a place which is, and I understand, and I say that, Mr. Mr. Speaker, under, and I look at you nervously as a representative for, for Belfast, um, know that there are others who would take a differing view. Um, but I don't think that, I think we are not, in a, not the sort of place where we don't want to get the reputation Unfortunately, there have been occasions where I think we have got this under, uh, reputation, uh, generally and usually through the planning system, uh, of not being receptive to certain types of new investment. I think this is one of those examples. Uh, and, and I understand, and I know that there will be people who will take a different view on it, uh, but I, for one, am very supportive of John Lewis coming to Northern Ireland, and I hope that the opportunity uh, isn't lost and that we can uh, secure that investment to Sprucefield or indeed wherever in Northern Ireland they may wish to uh, invest. Mr. Butler, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, for your answer, Minister. Um, can I ask, also, given the regional significance of the Sprucefield area and its strategic, strategic location on the Belfast to Dublin uh, corridor, what is his assessment of the full development of that site and its, in, uh, its environs? Well, I, I think um, clearly Sprucefield and um, much like the, the Mays site, not that far away, because of its location, has, has huge. Uh, investment opportunities that would not only benefit, and because of where they are situated, the benefit derived from any investment on, on either side would not be just to the benefit of the, the local area and, and to the city of Lisburn, but also to further afield and probably for the whole of the region. Uh, and, and in terms of its, uh, the development of that site, and that, that's, it is probably more a, a planning issue which resides, I think, now with the uh, Department of Infrastructure in terms of strategic planning policy for, for, for Northern Ireland. Uh, and I will leave it to that minister to. Uh, take that forward, but you know, I, I do think that we, we should be seeking to, and I think there are huge opportunities right across Northern Ireland, I think we are at the cusp of what could be quite a, exciting economic times for Northern Ireland, uh, I think there are going to be huge opportunities over the next number of years, but we can't be doing things that lock down sites and make sites uh, unavailable for development in, in the future. Call Mr Philip Logan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and yes, of course, I'd like to uh, congratulate Simon and uh, the Minister on his, uh, his new role and welcome the, the words that he has shared with uh, my colleague Mervyn Storey. We do look forward to welcoming you into North Antrim very yeah, soon. Yeah. Can, I, uh, can I ask the Minister uh, to outline for me how many cruise ships are expected to dock in Belfast this year? Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the growth in the number of, of cruise ships coming into, into Northern Ireland is, is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, it's something that I think, you know, ten years ago, the, the idea, the very idea that cruise ships would be coming into Belfast, would something would have been something that people would have laughed at. I think 
But we have now got a situation, Mr. Speaker, where this year, so 2016, uh, it is expected that 77 uh, cruise ships will dock in, in Belfast, and, and there's a new uh, terminal in the harbour seat for them to, to dock at. And I think that is, you know, that, that, that's something that has, uh, as I said, been a, a huge, uh, a huge increase in the number, from effectively from zero to 77 in very, very short order. Uh, and I think that is a, a vote of confidence in Northern Ireland generally. Um, and it's also a vote of confidence in our, on our tourism product, on our overall tourism product, because um, if we didn't have things such as the Giants Causeway in uh, the members' constituency, or Titanic Belfast, or Mount Stewart in my own constituency, for example, then there wouldn't be anywhere, for, people wouldn't want to necessarily stop here, and it wouldn't be a destination that would be on the, the itinerary of all of these uh, cruise liners. So I think this is something which does show the the huge progress in Northern Ireland as a whole, but also the, the particular development of our tourism sector. Mr. Logan, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that uh, encouraging news. Um, how many visitors do you envisage cruise ships bringing into Northern Ireland, um, and what are they expected to generate in, 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 to the local economy? Thank you. Bring them to Lawrence. <laughs> uh, the, um, so there's several bids for, for cruise ships there, I think, behind me. But if you take last year's figures, when there were, there were 59, uh, 59 cruise ships um, docking in Belfast last year, uh, and that brought in uh, 100, over 116,000 visitors, and that includes crew and, and guests. Um, it's estimated this year that the number, because of the increase in the number of ships, will go up to 100, over 143,000 guests and crew. Last year's figures. Um, it is estimated were, uh, that brought in so 59 ships and 116,000 people brought in £6 million of, of visitor spend into Northern Ireland. So we'd expect to, to exceed that um, with a greater number of, of cruise ships coming into Belfast. And I, I think it's something that, um, as I said, we didn't think was imaginable at the time. I think we should, we should warmly welcome them. We would hope that, particularly with the investment by, by Belfast uh, Harbour in a new terminal which is capable of, uh, of hosting vessels of, uh, of all sizes, um, and with our developing and improving uh, tourism product, uh, not just in Belfast but all around Northern Ireland, that we would see the number of cruise ships increase in, in future years, and of course the number of visitors and the amount of spend also some, um, in, increasing similarly. Call Ms. Katrina Rion. Ken Cordia, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too would join with everybody else in welcoming you to your first question time. Um, my question is: Have you assessed the tourism potential? of the Narrow Water Bridge project? I haven't specifically, uh, Mr. Speaker, assessed the, the tourism, but I mean, I'm, I'm fairly new to post, as the, the, the member will appreciate, and I uh, won't want to take some, some time to consider uh, a range of different projects that will, in some way or another, come across uh, my ministerial desk. Um, I know that this is a, a project which is a long-standing project and ambition of, of people, uh, not just in the uh, the Newry Morn and South Down area, but also across the border in, in County Louth as well. Um, I have some experience of it in a, in a previous role as finance minister, particularly around funding. And of course, unfortunately, funding uh, wasn't able to materialise because of a whole range of reasons a number of years ago. But as a member knows, this is a, a, a project to which the executive and the Irish government as well remain committed to in principle. <laughs> Ms. Ryan for a supplement. Well, I welcome uh, the Minister's positive tone and would he agree with me um, that it's very important that this executive delivers the infrastructure projects like the Narrow Water Bridge? I, I think developing, developing our, our economic infrastructure in whatever way that is, whether it's uh, roads or telecoms or energy infrastructure is incredibly important to improving. Um, our, our overall economy, um, by any, you know, in any measure, improving our economic infrastructure is, is, is key to increasing competitiveness and productivity and, and ensuring growth. Uh, and of course, that will part of that too is, is increasing and improving our, our connectivity. Um, and you know, th this is a, a, a small project um, in terms of the connectivity that it would do. But I understand, you know, from, from listening to particularly people from Warren Point and surrounding areas, that it is something that they see as having huge potential to grow. Uh, the tourism economy and attract visitors into their area, but uh, you know, I, I certainly haven't haven't had time to, to assess it. I don't know exactly whether there is a bid in for funding at this moment in time. That will not, I'm sure, come, come across my desk, but maybe the desk of other ministers. And I wouldn't want to say anything that would prejudice uh, the process that they would have to go through. But as I as I said before, it is a, is a project which the the last executive and, and the Irish government were both committed to in principle. 
call on Mr. Philip Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I too add my congratulations to the Minister and wish him every success in his new post? Uh, can I ask, is the Minister aware of research undertaken by the detail website into invest NI funding between April 2011 and September 2014, which showed that the old Ardsborough Council area received the lowest per capita funding in Northern Ireland out of all 26 councils? I, I'm not aware of the uh, specific research, but if, um, I'm sure now that the member has has raised it with me, I will, um, I will certainly take a look at it and uh, study, it, study it closely. Um, in terms of, of investment in TNI, I, I, I remember it's a very good example of the point that I was making to uh, Mr. Mike Phillips earlier, that there are other constituencies and areas, some of which are close to Belfast. There is this perception that all of the investment is, is going to Belfast uh, or the greater Belfast area. Uh, and the member's point is one that I'm, I'm familiar with in terms of, of uh, a perception in our own constituency that we don't get the same level of investment. In, in some, some respects, that is, I think, because of our closeness and proximity to Belfast. Um, but yet the member, the member will be aware, as I am aware of, of many great firms and businesses within our constituency, particularly those within the agri-food sector, who are, who are thriving and have, and have grown considerably over the last number of years, uh, creating employment uh, in our area and um, helping to uh, grow a, a, an incredibly important sector in our overall economy. Mr. Smith for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer and his comments. Uh, and as he rightly says, that yes, uh, obviously, Ards and, and Strangford constituency, uh, as it is now, is, is close in proximity to Belfast. Uh, but so too were uh, other areas who, who fared much better. Um, Newton Abbey, for example, got £295 per person, Antrim £265 investment per person, compared to just £33 in ARDS. So, can I ask the Minister what actions will the Minister take, that, unlike his predecessors, to ensure Strangford receives its fair share of funding in the future? Of course, I do want to, um, both as Minister and as a representative for that constituency, I do want to see investment in, in Strangford. Uh, increase and improve, just as I want to see it in every constituency across Northern Ireland. I will be doing my, my level best uh, to improve and increase investment for every constituency, and particularly, particularly that of Strangford. Um, I, you know, and I think you can, the member has, has, has touched on on, on Best Northern Ireland figures uh, and compared um, the Ardsborough Council area unfavourably to the, the old Ardsborough Council area, unfavourably to, for example, Newton Abbey. Um, I think there are other indicators, if you were looking at them, I'm happy to, to furnish the member with the precise detail, but if you look at, per, for example, tourism investment, and the member will know that whether you take it, um, you know, when you look at sub-regionally, the sub-regions will have different constructions of their own local economy. The local economy in the Strangford area will have a, a higher proportion of uh, tourism businesses, which will have received, I'm sure, more investment than many of those other council areas that the member received, because I do believe, and we are, we're of course biased in this regard, but we do have the most beautiful constituency in the whole of Northern Ireland, uh, and as a result, it has received much more in terms of visitors, and um, it has seen our, our tourism product develop and grow over the last number of years. So I'm, I'm happy, you know, I think there are, there are some figures which you can look at which show that it's not as good, but there are others, I'm sure, where you can look at which shows that um, other elements of the economy have received appropriate levels of, of support. I'm happy to provide the member with that, that detail. Call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Mr. Margaret, uh, I too want to add to the best wishes to the Minister um, on his new post. Uh, can I ask the Minister what plans you do have to implement regional targets for job creation in areas of high unemployment? Uh, that, that suffer high unemployment and continue to do so, like my own area in Straban and Derry? Margaret. As I was pointing out to, to Mr. McPhillips earlier, the, um, you know, there, there is a the member touches on high levels of, of, of unemployment, which is of course a, a fact in some parts of Northern Ireland, particularly in peripheral parts of Northern Ireland. Um, and you know, I think that Invest Northern Ireland, whatever the perception may be of its track record in trying to, to bring investment to areas such as the member's constituency, actually does have a, a good record of trying to bring investment and jobs to. Um, her constituency and others indeed in the west of the province, and I cited some of those examples to um, Mr. Rick Phillips earlier. Uh, I met um, with a, an investor in Straban, and the member is very fond of, of Straban, um, and I met with a, a huge investor in Straban, which is the old state who have a presence there. Uh, you know, and I think that whenever you have companies of that size and that stature, international firms like that, who see the merit in setting up in, in Straban, uh, I think it, it is a 
is a beacon to others to see the opportunities that are presented by uh, Stravan and um, the workforce, the skilled workforce that, that will be there. Ask the member to be quick in her supplementary and the minister to be quick in his response. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given um, that Strab Derry City and Straban District Council has uh, had recent job losses, particularly in Derry, uh, will the minister give an undertaking to come to Derry City and Straban District Council um, to, to meet with the North West Regional Task Force Group uh, to hear, their, hear from them their pro proposals on job creation and infrastructure? Gormagat. Yes, um, yes, I do intend to, to visit um, the North West, just as I in, intend to visit all ports of Northern Ireland. And I'd be keen to work with, with anybody and everybody, the local council and the chamber and, and Derry and others, to ensure that um, you know, whatever help and support that I can provide through my department and its agencies to uh, attract investment and increase jobs in, in, in that area can, can be done. And I, I think that you know, the, the executive as a whole has recognised the need to have a regionally balanced economy through the draft programme for government framework. I think that is something that we need to follow through now with and having a clear action plan as to how we want to deliver that. Time is up. Members might wish to take a raise while we change the top table.